It is now in order to consider amendment number two, printed in Part B of House Report 112-111. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Uh, Madam Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk and ask that it be reported. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number two, printed in Part B of House Report number 112-111, offered by Mr. Conyers of Michigan. Pursuant to House Resolution 316, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The House please come to order. The gentleman from Michigan deserves to be heard. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I ask uh, unanimous consent that I add uh, the gentleman from California, Dana Rohrbacher, uh, to this amendment as a co-sponsor. Uh, uh, the, the gentleman, I, uh, I want to make the gentleman aware that amendments cannot have co-sponsors. And I yield myself two and a half minutes. The gentleman's recognized for two and a half minutes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this bipartisan amendment adds an important provision to House Resolution 1249. It would permit the conversion of the United States to a first-to-file system only upon a presidential finding that other nations have adopted a similar one-year grace period. This one-year grace period protects the ability of an inventor to discuss or write about his or her ideas for a patent up to a year before he or she actually files for patent protection. And without this great spirit, an inventor could lose uh, his or her own patent. This grace period provision within H.R. 1249 would grant an inventor a one-year period between the time he first publishes his invention to the time when he's required to file a patent. During this time, this would prohibit anyone else from seeing this publication, stealing the idea, and quickly filing a patent behind the inventor's back. Yet the only way for American inventors to benefit from the grace period provision contained in 1249 is to ensure that the foreign countries adopt a similar grace period as well. The amendment would encourage other countries to adopt a similar period in their patent systems consistent with a recommendation by the National Academy's National Research Council. Current law in the United States allows a grace period of one year during which an applicant can disclose or commercialize an invention before filing for a patent. Japan offers a limited grace period and Europe provides none. Uh, if the first to file provision in the bill is implemented, we must ensure that American in inventors are not disadvantaged. Small American inventors in universities are disadvantaged abroad in those nations where there is no grace period. Gentleman's time has expired. Gentleman from Texas. I'm sure I rise in opposition to Gentlemen, the amendment. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, the Conyers Amendment to tie the changes proposed in the America Invents Act to future changes that would be made in foreign law is unworkable. I oppose providing a trigger in U.S. law that leaves our patent system at the mercy of actions to be taken at a future date by the Chinese, Russians, French, or any other country. It is our constitutional duty to write the laws for this great land. We cannot delegate that responsibility to the whims of foreign powers. I know that this idea has been floated in the past, but after working on several pieces of patent legislation over the past several Congresses, and particularly this year on H.R. 1249, it has become clear that this type of trigger idea is simply not workable and counterproductive. The move to a first inventor to file system creates a more efficient and reliable patent system that benefits all inventors, including independent inventors. 
The bill provides a more transparent and certain grace period, a key feature of U.S. law, and a more definite filing date that enables inventors to promote, fund, and market their technology while making them less vulnerable to costly patent challenges that disadvantage independent inventors. Under first inventor to file, an inventor submits an application to the patent office that describes their invention and how to make it. That, along with a $110 fee, gets them a provisional application and preserves their filing date. This allows the inventor an entire year to complete the application while retaining the earlier filing date. By contrast, the cost of an interference proceeding before the PTO often runs to a half a million dollars. The current first to invent system harms small businesses and independent inventors. Former PTO Commissioner Gerald Mossinghoff conducted a study that proves smaller entities are disadvantaged in PTO interference proceedings that arise from disputes over patent ownership under the current system. Independent inventors and small companies lose more often than they win in these disputes. Plus, bigger companies are better able to absorb the cost of participating in these protracted proceedings. In addition, many inventors also want protection from their patents outside the United States. If you plan on selling your product overseas, you need to secure an early filing date. If you don't have a clear filing date, you can be shut out from the overseas market. A change to first inventor to file will help our businesses grow and ensure that American goods and services will be available in markets across the globe. In the last seven years, only one independent inventor out of three million patent applications filed has prevailed over the inventor who filed first. One out of three million. So there is no need for this amendment. Independent inventors lose to other applicants with deeper pockets that are better equipped to exploit the current complex legal environment. So the first to file change makes it easier and less complicated for U.S. inventors to get patent protection around the world. And it eliminates the legal bills that come with the interference proceedings under the current system. It is a key provision of this bill that should not be contingent upon actions by foreign powers and delay what would be positive reforms for independent inventors and our patent system. The first inventor to file provision is necessary for U.S. competitiveness and innovation. It makes our patent system stronger, <coughs> increases patent certainty, and reduces the cost of frivolous litigation. However, if you support the U.N. having military control over our troops, or if you support the concept of an international court at The Hague, then you would support this amendment's proposal of a trigger that subjects U.S. domestic law to the whims of governments in Europe, China, or Russia. It really would be unprecedented to hold U.S. law hostage to legal changes made overseas and would completely go against what this great country stands for and what our founders fought for, the independent rights and liberties we have today. For these reasons, Madam Chair, I am strongly opposed to the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Michigan. I yield the balance of our time to the gentleman from California, Dana Rohrbacher. The gentleman from California is recognized for two and a half minutes. Uh, let's just note that uh, Ms. Lofgren last night uh, presented a, uh, a case to, uh, uh, to uh, this body, which I felt uh, demonstrated the danger that we have in this law. A move to first to file system, which is what this bill would do, without a corresponding one-year grace period in other countries, dramatically undermines the patent protection of American inventors. Some of us believe that's the purpose of this bill, because they want to harmonize American law with the weak systems overseas. Well, without this amendment, which we are talking about right now, without the conyers rohrbacher amendment, if an inventor discloses uh, his discoveries, perhaps to potential investors, his right to patent protection is essentially gone. It's not gone from just Americans, yeah, he would be protected under American law, but from all those people in foreign countries without a similar grace period to what we have here in our system, they, these people are not restricted. Uh, thus, they could, once an American inventor discloses it at any time, they can go and file a patent and steal 
our inventors' discoveries. The only way for American inventors to benefit from a grace period here, which this bill is all about, is to ensure that foreign countries adopt the same grace period. And that's what this amendment would do. It would say that our bill, which will make uh, our inventors uh, 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 vulnerable to foreign theft will not go into place until those foreign countries have put in place a similar grace period which then would prevent them for, and, and their citizens from wholesaling coming in and stealing our technology. Uh, Ms. Lofgren uh, detailed that last night in great detail how that would work. Uh, I, don't, I call this, uh, basically this bill, this is the Unilateral Disclosure Act, if not the Patent Ripoff Act, because we are the disclosing to the world what we've got, and our people can't follow up on it because there's a grace period here, but overseas, they don't have that same grace period. So what we're saying to prevent foreigners from stealing American technology is this will not go into effect until the president has, has uh, issued a statement verifying that the co other countries of the world have a similar grace period so they can't just at will rip off America's uh, greatest entrepreneurs and inventors. Gentlemen's time has expired. All time has expired. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, could we get a record vote, please? Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment by the gentleman from Michigan will be postponed. It is now in order to consider Amendment No. 3, printed in Part B of House Report 112-111. For what purpose does the gentle gentlewoman from Wisconsin seek recognition? Madam Chair, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment No. 3, printed in Part B of House Report No. 112-111, offered by Ms. Baldwin of Wisconsin. Pursuant to House Resolution 316, the gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin, and a member opposed each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Wisconsin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield myself three and one half minutes. Gentlewoman is recognized for three and a half minutes. Thank you. I rise to urge adoption of the Baldwin Sensenbrenner Amendment that strikes Section 5 in the American, America Invents Act. Section 5 expands the prior user rights defense from its present narrow scope to broadly apply to all patents with minimal exceptions. As we work to rebuild our economy, Congress should be doing all that it can to foster small business innovation and investment. I believe that Section 5 will do just the opposite. Expanding prior user rights will be disastrous for small American innovators as well as university researchers and ultimately slow job creation. Despite current challenges, the U.S. patent system remains the envy of the world. Since the founding of our nation, inventions have been awarded exclusive rights in exchange for public disclosure. This system also creates incentives for investing in new ideas and fostering new ways of thinking and encouraging further advancements and disclosures. It promotes progress. If proponents of expanding prior user rights have their way with this legislation, they will give new rights to those who have previously developed and used uh, the same process or product, even if they never publicly divulged their innovation and never even applied for a patent. It will transform our patent system from one that values transparency to one that rewards secrecy. To understand why expanding prior user rights runs counter to the public interest, it is important to reiterate how critical exclusive rights are for inventions to gain marketplace value and acquire capital. For startups and small businesses, raising necessary capital is vital and challenging. The expansion of prior user rights would only make that task all the more difficult. Under the system proposed in the American Invents Act, investors would have no way of determining whether anyone had previously developed and used the process or product that they were seeking to patent. In such a scenario, a patent might be valuable or relatively worthless. The inventor and potential investors would have no means of determining which was true. 
Madam Chairwoman, I'd like to boast for a moment, if I could, about Stratatech a fiercely innovative uh, small business in Madison run by a top researcher at the University of Wisconsin who through her research there developed a living human skin substitute. This living skin is a groundbreaking treatment method that we hope will ultimately save the lives of American troops who have suffered burns while serving in Iraq and Afghanistan. The company was recently awarded nearly $4 million to continue clinical trials for their tissue product. And what can save lives in a desert combat setting abroad will assuredly transform the way doctors save lives of burn victims in hospitals around our country and around the world. Now, I wonder if Stratatech would have been able to drive this phenomenal innovation and life-saving technology as far as they have with a patent that provides only conditional exclusivity. Would investors have felt as secure advancing this technology in a system shrouded in secrecy? What if Stratatech's patent was subject to the claims of an unlimited... I yield myself 15 additional seconds. Gentlewoman is recognized. Uh, if we let Section 5 stand, it is unclear to me whether a, simple company, a similar company would ever secure the funding that they need to grow. I urge my colleagues to adopt the Baldwin Sensenbrenner Amendment, and I reserve the balance of my time. Gentlewoman reserves. Gentleman from Texas. Madam Chair, I rise in opposition to the amendment. Gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, this amendment strikes the prior user rights provisions from the bill. I strongly oppose this amendment. The bill expands prior user rights, a strong pro-job, pro-manufacturing provision. This provision will help bring manufacturing jobs back to this country. It allows factories to continue using manufacturing processes without fear of costly litigation. It is absolutely a key component of this bill. The provision has the strong support of American manufacturers and the support of all the major university associations and technology transfer associations. These include the Association of American Universities, American Council on Education, Association of American Medical Colleges, Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, Association of University Technology Managers, and the Council on Government Relations representing the vast majority of American universities. Prior user rights ensure that the first inventor of a new process or product used in manufacturing can continue to do so. This provision has been carefully crafted between stakeholders and the university community. The language provides an effective exclusion for most university patents, so this provision focuses on helping those in the private sector. The prior user defense is not overly expansive and will protect American manufacturers from having to patent the hundreds or thousands of processes they already use in their plants. After getting initial input from the university community, they recommended that we make the additional changes reflected in this bill to ensure that prior user rights will work effectively for all private sector stakeholders. Prior user rights are important as part of our change to a first-to-file system. I believe it is important to ensure that we include these rights to help our job-creating manufacturers across the United States. The philosophical objections of a lone tech transfer office in Wisconsin should not counter the potential of this provision for job creation throughout America. There are potentially thousands or hundreds of thousands of unemployed Americans who are looking for manufacturing jobs and could benefit from this provision. Without this provision, businesses say they may be unable to expand their factories and hire American workers if they are prevented from continuing to operate their facilities the way they have for years. For many manufacturers, the patent system presents a catch-22. If they patent a process, they disclose it to the world and foreign manufacturers will learn of it and in many cases use it in secret without paying licensing fees. The patents issued on manufacturing processes are very important to police and oftentimes patenting the idea simply means giving the invention away to foreign competitors. On the other hand, if the U.S. manufacturer doesn't patent the process, then under the current system, a later party can get a patent and force the manufacturer to stop using a process that they independently invented and used. In recent years, it has become easier for a factory owner to idle or shut down parts of his plant and move operations and jobs overseas rather than risk their livelihood through an interference proceeding before the PTO. The America Invents Act does away with these proceedings and includes the pro-manufacturing and constitutional provision of prior user rights. 
This provision creates a powerful incentive for manufacturers to build new plants and new facilities in the United States. Right now, all foreign countries recognize prior user rights, and that has played a large role in attracting American manufacturing jobs and facilities to these countries. H.R. 1249 finally corrects this imbalance and strongly encourages businesses to create manufacturing jobs in this country. The prior user rights provision promotes job creation in America. Prior user rights will help manufacturers, small business, and other innovative industries strengthen our economy. It will help our businesses grow and allow innovation to flourish. I strongly support prior user rights, and so I oppose this amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. The gentlewoman from Wisconsin. Uh, I would now yield the balance of our time to uh, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, Thank you very much, Madam the Chair. Recognized for a minute and a quarter. Madam Chair, uh, this expansion of prior user rights is a step in the wrong direction. It goes against what this House determined four years ago when we last debated this issue, and also it is different than what the Senate has done uh, in March of this year. The fundamental principle of patent law is disclosure. And the provision in this bill that the amendment seeks to strike goes directly against disclosure and instead encourages people who may invent not to even file for a patent, and that will slow down uh, research in expanding the knowledge of humans. The gentleman from Texas talks about manufacturing. I'm all for manufacturing. I think we all are all for manufacturing. But what this does is it helps old manufacturing, which we need to help. But it also puts new manufacturing in the deep freeze because they use the disclosures that uh, are required as a part of a patent application. You vote for the amendment for disclosure and advancement of human knowledge. You vote against the amendment if you want secrecy in this process. And I yield back the balance of my time. All time has expired. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wisconsin. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those, in, those opposed say no. The opinion of the chair, the noes have it. Madam Chair, the amendment is not Madam agreed chair, to. I seek a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wisconsin will be postponed. Order to consider amendment number 4, printed in Part B of House Report 112-111. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Wisconsin seek recognition? Um, Madam Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. Clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number 4, printed in Part B of House Report number 112-111 offered by Ms. Moore of Wisconsin. Pursuant to House Resolution 316, the gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Moore, will have, uh, and the, a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Wisconsin. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I yield myself as much time as I may consume. The gentlewoman is recognized. My amendment would ensure that we have the proper data to identify and work with sectors of the U.S. economy that are participating in the patent process at significantly lower rates. Specifically, my amendment allows the USPTO to develop methods for ways to track the diversity of patent applicants. It also specifically prohibits the office from using any such results for any preferential treatment in the application process. Um, I certainly do uh, applaud the USPTO for their outreach to uh, the Women's Chamber of Commerce and to the National Minority Enterprise Development Conferences to try to increase diversity with utilizing the patent process. Um, but some recent data have raised concern that minorities and women-owned businesses are just not keeping up with the patent process. Preliminary data from a 2009 Kaufman Foundation survey of new businesses show that minority-owned technology co companies hold fewer patents and copyrights after the fifth year of starting. 
than, than comparable non-minority businesses. In fact, the Kaufman data show that minority-owned firms with patents hold only two on average compared with the eight of their counterparts. And another survey uh, uses National Science Foundation data to suggest that women commercialize their patents 7% less than their male counterparts. Now, the best example I can think of this is uh, the late, great Wa George Washington Carver, who we all know dis discovered 300 uses for peanuts and hundreds more for other plants. He went on to help local farmers with many improvements to their farm equipment, ingredients, and chemicals. However, Carver only applied for three patents. Some historians have written on whether or not Eli Whitney was indeed the original inventor of the cotton gin, or whether the invention could have originated from the slave community. At the time, slaves were unable to register an invention with the patent office, and the owner could not patent on their behalf because of the requirement to be an original inventor. Now, African Americans and women have a long history of inventing some of the most influential products in our society. But we also simply do not have enough information to further explore and explain these results. And as our government and industry leaders look into these problems and possibly fix for these deficiencies, they run into a major hurdle. Currently, the Patent and Trade Office only knows the name and general location of a patent applicant. In most cases, the only, physical, only the physical street address that the office collects is for the listed patent attorney on the application. Such limited information prevents us from fully understanding the nature and scope of the underrepresentation of minority communities in intellectual property. Until we can truly understand the nature of this problem, we cannot address it or do the appropriate outreach. I would reserve the balance of my time. I will yield. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I just want to say to the gentleman from Wisconsin that I appreciate her offering the amendment and I urge my colleagues to support it. Thank the you. Gentleman from Wisconsin. I, uh, I certainly, again, want to commend uh, efforts from Director Kappas and the Patent and Trade Office that despite they're not having to do it, they do reach out to women and minority communities to try to get them to utilize the Patent Office. Um, I can say that the ability to innovate and create is just one part of the equation. The key to success for minorities in our community as a whole also depends upon the ability to get protection for their intellectual property. And I would yield back the balance of my time Gen and um, uh, urge the body to vote for this amendment. Gentlewoman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Wisconsin. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. The opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number five, printed in part B of House Report 112-111. For what purpose does the gentlewoman from Texas seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number five, printed in part B of House Report number 112-111, offered by Ms. Jackson Lee of Texas. Pursuant to House Resolution 316, the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from Texas. Uh, Madam Chair, as I rise to offer my amendment, I take just a moment of personal privilege to say that whatever side members are on on this issue, I know that members want to protect the genius of America. I'd like to thank my ranking member, Mr. Conyers, for that commitment uh, as he comes from one of the original genius proponents, and that is the auto industry uh, that uh, propelled America into uh, the job creation of the century. And to the chairperson of the committee, Mr. Smith, who ventured out uh, in efforts to, uh, to provide opportunities uh, for protecting, uh, again, uh, the opportunities for invention uh, and genius. My amendment uh, speaks, I think, in particular uh, to uh, the population, vast population of startups, small businesses that are impacted uh, by this legislation. Uh, in particular, it is a reinforcement of Congress's position 
uh, that indicates that the patent system should promote industries to continue to develop new technologies that spur growth and create jobs across the country, which includes protecting the rights of small businesses and inventors from predatory behavior that could, be, that could result in the cutting off of innovation. We recognize that small and minority businesses and women-owned businesses, which dominate the landscape of America, are really major job creators. Small business is thriving in my own home state of Texas as well. There were 386,422 small employers in Texas in 2006, accounting for 98.7% of the state and state's employers and 46.8% of its private sector employment. We know that there are a large number of women-owned businesses and as well growing African-American and Latino. But we need more growth with Asian businesses, small businesses, Hispanic, Native American, African American, uh, all forms of businesses that are part of growing this economy. Small businesses make up a large portion of our employer network. It is important to understand how they will be impacted as a result of patent, patent reform. In this first to file, for example, small businesses may in fact uh, be concerned about trying to get investors and as they get investors they may have to disclose and so this sense of Congress will put us on notice that we need to be careful that we allow at least the opportunity for these investors and we continue to look at the bill to ensure that it responds to that opportunity we must recognize again as I said that small businesses create jobs uh, and the number of new jobs that they have created are 64 percent net jobs over the past 15 years. My amendment again reinforces the idea that small businesses can survive in this climate. Now I did offer an amendment which provided for a transitional review program for five years or asked for that to be sunsetted. It was all about trying to protect our small businesses. But I believe this amendment, with its firm statement, uh, gathers Congress around the idea that nothing in this bill will inhibit small businesses from being creative. And we can, as well, recognize all of the growth that has come about from the ideas of small businesses. I think my amendment also reinforces that we do not wish to engage in any uh, undue takings of property because we indicate that we want to see the innovativeness of American businesses continue. I believe this is an important statement because the bill is about innovation, genius, creation, job creation, and it should be about small businesses. Small businesses should be as much uh, comfortable with going to the patent office as our large businesses. And in years to come, because of this major reform, we should see small businesses creating opportunity for growth uh, as they develop not into small and medium size, but huge international companies. So I am asking my colleagues to support this amendment, uh, and as well, uh, I am recognizing that we do have the opportunity to turn the corner and to put a stamp of new job creation on America. Uh, with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas. Madam Chair, I claim the time in opposition, although I support the amendment. Gentlemen's recognized. Madam Chair, I understand the underlying point of the member's amendment, and I want to make it clear that my interpretation of this amendment and its intent is to highlight the problem posed by entities that pose as financial or technological businesses, but whose sole purpose is not to create, but to sue. I am talking about patent trolls, those entities that vacuum up patents by the hundreds or thousands, and whose only innovations occur in the courtroom. This sense of Congress shows how these patent trolls can hurt small businesses and independent inventors before they even have a chance to get off the ground. This bill is designed to help all inventors and ensure that small businesses will continue to be a fountain for job creation and innovation. Uh, for these reasons, uh, Madam Chair, I support the amendment. Gentlemen, you yield, yield back, back to my time. time. Uh, the question is on the amendment offered by the gentlewoman from Texas. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. Madam Speaker, I would like to have a recorded vote. Pursuant to Clause 6 of Rule 18, further proceedings on the amendment by the gentlelady from 
Texas will be postponed. It is now in order to consider amendment number six, part, printed in part B of House Report 112-111. For what purpose does the gentleman from New Mexico rise? Madam Chair, I rise today. Uh, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number six, printed in part B of House Report number 112-111, offered by Mr. Lujan of New Mexico. Pursuant to House Resolution 316, the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Lujan, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from New Mexico. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I rise today in support of my amendment to H.R. 1249, the American Vents Act. The American Vents Act provides for the creation of United States Patent and Trademark Office satellite offices. For many small businesses and independent inventors, navigating the patent application process can be challenging. Small businesses, entrepreneurs, and innovators are the foundation of our economy, but do not always have the resources that larger corporations or institutions have to assist them in obtaining a patent. By improving access to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, Satellite offices have the potential to help small businesses and independent investors and inventors navigate the patent application process. However, this bill essentially provides no guidance to determine the location of such satellite offices. While the language in the bill contains stated purposes for satellite offices, it does not specify that these purposes be part of the selection process. This amendment makes it explicit that the purposes of the satellite offices, which are included in the underlying bill, such as increasing outreach activities to better connect patent filers and innovators with the USPTO, to be part of the selection process. It also specifies that the economic impact to the region be considered, as well as the availability of knowledgeable personnel, so that the new patent examiners can be hired at minimal recruitment cost, saving taxpayers money. The selection of USPTO satellite offices should be done in a way that supports economic growth and puts investors and inventors on a path to success. I think this is a common sense amendment and I urge the adoption. Thank you, Madam Chair, and reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Texas. Uh, Madam Chair, I rise in opposition and claim the time in opposition, though I favor the amendment. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Uh, Madam Chair, Section 23 of the bill requires the PTO director to establish three or more satellite offices in the United States subject to available resources. The provision lists criteria that the director must take into account when selecting each office. This is a good addition to H.R. 1249, and I urge my colleagues to support it. I also hope that one of those offices is in Austin, Texas. I'll yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from New Mexico. Madam Chair, I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, all times yielded back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from New Mexico. Those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. I'm for what the gentlewoman from Texas rise? Aye. Unanimous consent. Because of the graciousness of the ranking member, Mr. Conyers, and the chairman, uh, Mr. Smith, of um, agreeing to my amendment, Jackson Lee, uh, number four, that was just debated, I ask unanimous consent to withdraw my request for a record vote. Objection to the gentlewoman's request. The request is withdrawn. Thank you. Was he adopted by voice vote? Thank you. It is now in order to consider amendment number seven, printed in part B of House Report 112-111. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan rise? Amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. House Report number 112-111, offered by Mr. Peters of Michigan. Pursuant to House resolution, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Peters, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan for Thank five you. minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, while the America Invents Act makes a number of important changes to our patent system targeted at reducing the USPTO backlogs and, and driving innovation, I believe that we must do more to help our nation's small businesses compete in the global marketplace. Success in the global economy depends more and more on IP assets, 
America's IP intensive industries employ nearly 18 million workers at all education and skills levels and represent 60 percent of U.S. exports. While obtaining a U.S. patent is a critical first step in our for our innovators towards recouping their R&D cost, capitalizing on their inventions and creating jobs, a U.S. patent only provides protections against infringements here at home. If an inventor does not register in a foreign market, such as China, they have no protection there if the Chinese economy begins production of their patented invention. Not only is a foreign patent protection necessary to ensure the ability to enforce patent rights abroad, it is necessary to defend American innovators and inventors against foreign lawsuits. High costs along with language and technical barriers prevent many American small business firms from filing for foreign patent protection. Lack of patent protection both at home and abroad increases, increases uncertainty for innovators and the likelihood of piracy. While we must reduce backlogs at the USPTO to make domestic patent protection more attainable, we must also look forward to finding ways to help our manufacturers and other IP intensive industries compete globally. This is why I'm offering a common sense bipartisan amendment to the American Invents Act with my colleague, Representative Renacci, who I'd also like to thank for working with me on this important issue. Uh, this amendment mandates the USPTO-led study with the SBA to determine the best method to help small businesses obtain, maintain, and enforce foreign patents. This study is to be conducted using existing resources at no cost to the taxpayers and does not alter the score of the bill. I believe our amendment will help Congress and the USPTO determine the best ways to help American small businesses protect their IP assets, compete globally, and boost exports. I'd like to thank Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Conyers for working with us on this amendment and urge passage of the peters Renacci Amendment. I yield to my colleague from Ohio, Representative Renacci. The gentleman from Ohio is recognized for two and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding and thank the gentleman from Michigan for his hard work on the amendment on behalf of American small businesses. I rise today in strong support of the peters Renacci Amendment a common sense, no cost study to determine the best method for American small businesses to obtain and enforce patent protections in foreign countries. Industries that rely on intellectual properties employ nearly 18 million American workers and represent 60 percent of American exports. As these industries continue to grow globally, foreign patent protection will become increasingly important to protect these workers' jobs, promote exports, and expand our economy. Our economy is becoming more global by the day with foreign investors testing the outer reaches of imagination and enjoying the strong support of their home nations. China, for example, is becoming increasingly aggressive at protecting their innovators' intellectual property rights and is subsidizing applications for foreign patents. We must develop a way here at home to make American small businesses equally competitive in the foreign marketplace. In order, to be, in order to compete with China, we have to stand behind our innovators with equal force. Our amendment simply directs the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office to conduct a joint study with the Small Business Administration to issue recommendations on how America can do just that. Furthermore, this study is to be completed within 120 days, giving the 112th Congress ample time to implement its recommendations. Not only are jobs in the economy paramount, promoting American innovation is also important. Innovation is about much more than economic growth. It breaks boundaries, connects people from distant lands, fires the imagination, and sends a message to those who need it most. Americans should be on the cutting edge of innovation, and this amendment is a good first step toward that direction. I would again like to thank Mr. Peters, as well as Chairman Smith and Ranking Member Conyers. I urge support of the amendment, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas. Um, Madam Chair, I claim the time in opposition, although I support the amendment. Without objection, the gentleman is recognized. Uh, Madam Chair, I understand the underlying point of the member's amendment, but other legislation and patent reform in particular have taught us that even small changes can have unintended consequences unless they have been vetted and gone through the regular committee process. The problem is in the details. This amendment is drafted as a study. I agree with the first part of the amendment, but not the second, 
because its objectives are written very much like a piece of legislation. It seeks to create support for a new program whereby taxpayer funds would be used to pay patent fees in foreign countries. I am strongly committed to helping our small businesses and independent inventors secure their rights and have a level playing field abroad. But I can't support a result that could create a new entitlement program, a new bureaucracy, and the transferring of taxpayer dollars directly to the treasuries of foreign governments. We should not use taxpayer funds to pay uh, patent filing fees to foreign governments. I do agree with the first part of this study, and I'm interested to see how the PTO, in coordination with other agencies, can figure out ways to help small businesses with international patent protection. I hope that this will be the focus of the study. The results of this study will show that small business outreach, educational and technical assistance programs are the most effective tools for small business and independent inventors. I think that the PTO needs to continue its efforts to reach out to small businesses and independent inventors. This bill includes a provision creating a permanent small business ombudsman at the PTO to work with small businesses to help them secure their patent rights. The PTO also conducts small business outreach programs throughout the country, teaching small businesses about IP enforcement and how to protect their intellectual property both at home and abroad. Though I do not agree with the policy outline in the second part of the study and would strongly recommend that the PTO and SBA determine that such a program should not be established, I will support this amendment to initiate the study and hope that the bulk of it will focus on how to better utilize existing government resources for education and technical assistance to help small businesses with international patent protection. Um, before I yield back the balance of my time, I hope that the movers of this amendment might be willing to reassure me and others about the intent and goals of this study. Now I'll yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Michigan has 15 seconds remaining. Well, I just uh, appreciate uh, the support uh, for this amendment. It's an important amendment to uh, give us information to, to, that we can then use to support our small businesses as they're doing business abroad and urge adoption. Gentleman yields back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Michigan. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. It is now in order to consider amendment number eight, printed in part B of House Report 112-111. For what purpose does the gentleman from Colorado seek recognition? I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment number eight, printed in part B of House Report number 112-111 offered by Mr. Polis of Colorado. Pursuant to House Resolution 316, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Polis, and a member opposed will each control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. I mean, excuse me, the gentleman from Colorado. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, H.R. 1249 uh, correctly changes the policy involving tax strategy patents. Uh, under current law, although it was current law that was never specifically contemplated by lawmakers, tax strategy methods are patentable. Now, these tax strategy patents have complicated the tax filing process uh, and allowed uh, common sense uh, filing techniques to uh, be patentable. So H.R. 1249 removes this complication by mandating that tax strategies are deemed insufficient to dis differentiate a claimed invention from the prior art. Uh, I strongly support uh, this provision. Uh, now, however, there are a number of folks that are currently involved with the process of applying for tax strategy patents, and in effect, uh, we risk changing the rules of the game retroactively for them, a form uh, of takings. Uh, there are currently 160 tax strategy patent applications uh, in the process. Uh, many of the inventors have uh, decided to uh, devote thousands of hours of time to disclose their innovations. And again, had this window of patentability never been opened, and it never should have been, this would not have been an issue because these inventors would have retained their innovations as trade secrets. Uh, however, uh, you can't blame them for saying, okay, there's a window on patentability. I will disclose so that I can have the 17-year exclusive. Um, and now the risk is that that calculation that they made to disclose uh, is being changed retroactively insofar as they will no longer have the they will no longer have the ability to protect their innovation as a trade secret. Um, in their patent applications, these applicants have described how to make and use their inventions, uh, and many have even provided computer programs, including code, to carry them out. The patent applications have been published, and some have been pending for many years. Changing the law midstream 
fundamentally hurts these applicants who did all that was proper under the law at the time they filed their patent application. The underlying bill as drafted would make those patent applications useless, and because the patent applications have been published, the patent applicants uh, will get nothing for disclosing their secrets except the expense of pursuing a patent and, of course, the ability of others to replicate uh, their innovation. Um, competitors would be free to use their disclosures in the published patent application process. Changing the law midstream simply sends the wrong message to inventors that one cannot trust the law that is in place when they file a patent. Congress would be sending a message uh, unless my amendment is incorporated into the underlying bill, uh, that all inventors on any subject matter uh, may have their disclosures taken away from them after they have made a decision to apply for a patent by retroactively uh, negating the possibility of them receiving a patent. Tax strategy patents should never, been have, never have, should have never been allowed under the law. I think there's broad agreement uh, among all of us in this chamber uh, on that topic. Uh, it's unfortunate that there was a window. However, uh, rational inventors making a conscious choice said, hey, in favor of disclosing, uh, I will then accept the 17-year monopoly, and they're now being penalized for making what uh, was a very reasonable decision. Uh, restore equity to the American Events Act by supporting my amendment. I hope members on both sides of the aisle uh, will support this, which um, effectively uh, addresses only those 160 applications that are, that are in effect now. It certainly continues and is supportive of the ban on future patents for tax strategies, but um, there seem to be very few alternatives or remedies to the takings that would otherwise occur under this bill uh, unless my amendment is incorporated. So I strongly urge a uh, yes vote uh, on the amendment, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Gentleman from Texas. Uh, Madam Chair, I claim the time in opposition. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. And I'll yield two minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, who is the chairman of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for two minutes. Madam Chairman, I rise in strong opposition to this amendment. Increasingly, individuals and companies are filing patents to protect tax strategies. When one individual or business is given the exclusive right to a particular method of complying with the tax code, it increases the costs and complexities for every other citizen or tax preparer to comply with the tax code. It is not difficult to foresee a situation where taxpayers are forced to choose between paying a royalty in order to reap the best tax treatment and complying with the tax code in another less favorable way. Tax strategy patents add additional costs and complications to an already overly complex process, and this is not what Congress intended when it passed the federal tax laws or the patent laws. The problem with tax strategy patents has been growing, a growing concern for over a decade. Over 140 tax strategy patents have already been issued and more applications are pending. Tax strategy patents have the potential to affect tens of millions of everyday taxpayers, many who do not even realize these patents exist. This amendment would allow any tax strategy patent that was filed as of the date of enactment of the bill to move toward issuance by the PTO. However, tax strategy patents are a bad public policy whether they were filed the day before or the day after this bill happens to be enacted. The effective date of the underlying bill rightly applies to any patent applications pending on the date of enactment in order to reduce the cost of filing taxes for all Americans and re restore common sense to our patent system. I urge my colleagues to oppose this amendment. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen. Gentleman from Texas. Um, Madam Chair, I'll yield one minute to the gentleman from California, Mr. Sherman. Gentleman from California is recognized for one minute. I have tremendous respect from the gentleman from Colorado, but I rise in opposition uh, to this amendment. Uh, this amendment would cover not only those patent applications that were on file yesterday, but as I understand it, also those that are filed tomorrow. Uh, tax strategy patents are a bad idea. As the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants states, uh, it's bad public policy. No one should be granted a monopoly over a form of compliance with the federal tax code. This amendment is opposed not only by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, uh, but also my uh, colleague, uh, co-chair of the CPA caucus, Mike Conway, and a majority of the caucus, uh, together uh, with the American uh, College of Trusts and Estate Council and the Certified Financial Planner uh, Board of Standards. Keep in mind, the purpose of a patent is to encourage innovation. What interest does the federal government have in encouraging innovative ways to avoid paying taxes to the federal government? 
Uh, this, uh, we, it's now time to draw a line against patents on tax compliance. I yield back. Gentleman from Texas. Madam Chair, I'll yield myself the balance of my time. Gentleman. The gentleman has two and a half minutes remaining. Gentleman is recognized. Madam Chair, I oppose the amendment to change the effective date for the tax strategy methods section of the bill. It is possible to patent tax strategy methods, but it is bad policy. It is not fair to permit patents on techniques regularly used to satisfy a government mandate, such as the one that requires individuals and businesses to pay taxes. Tax preparers, lawyers, and planners have a long history of sharing their knowledge regarding how to file returns, plan estates, and advise clients. They maintain that allowing the patentability of tax strategy methods will complicate the tax filing process and inhibit the ability of preparers to provide quality services for their clients. The effective date applies to any patent application that is pending on or filed on or after the date of enactment and to any patent that is issued on or after that date. The gentleman's amendment eliminates the application of this provision to those applications pending on the date of enactment. These applications have not been approved, so I disagree with excluding these patents in waiting. It was a mistake for the PTO to issue these patents in the first place, given their potential to harm individual taxpayers and tax return preparers. We shouldn't leave the door ajar by allowing more applications in. This just compounds the very problem we're trying to solve. I oppose the gentleman's amendment, and I urge my colleagues to vote against it. And I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. All time has been yielded back. The question is on the amendment offered by the gentleman from Colorado. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. no. In the opinion of the chair, the noes have it. The amendment is not agreed to. It is now in order to consider Amendment No. 9, printed in Part B of House Report 112-111. For what purpose does the gentleman from Michigan seek recognition? Madam Speaker, I have an amendment at the desk. The clerk will designate the amendment. Amendment No. 9, printed in Part B of House Report No. 112-111, offered by Mr. Conyers of Michigan. Pursuant to House Resolution 316, the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Conyers, and a member opposed, each will control five minutes. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Michigan. Thank you. I uh, have a bipartisan amendment that makes a technical revision to H.R. 1249. Uh, it addresses the confusion regarding the calculation of the filing period for patent term extension applications under the Hatch-Waxman Act. By uh, eliminating confusion regarding the deadline for patent term extension applications, this amendment provides the certainty necessary to encourage costly investments in life-saving medical research. It also uh, is consistent with the only court case to address this issue uh, entitled The Medicines Company versus Kapos. As a result of this amendment, all applications and cases will be treated henceforth in the same manner. I also want to point out that this exact language has passed the House overwhelmingly on a vo voice vote in the past and a prior version of the provision was unanimously passed uh, by the House on two previous occasions and was also, uh, in another instance, voted out uh, by the Senate Judiciary Committee on a bipartisan basis. It was also accepted uh, in a voice vote uh, by the House Judiciary Committee at a markup earlier uh, this year. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll reserve the balance of my time. Gentleman reserves the balance of his time. Gentleman from Texas. Madam Chair, I claim the time in opposition. Gentleman's recognized for five minutes. Madam Chair, in 2001, a biotech entity called the Medicines Company, or Medco, submitted an application for a patent extension that the PTO ruled was one day late. This application would have extended patent protection for a drug the company developed called Angiomax. 
In August 2010, a U.S. District Court ordered the PTO to use a more consistent way of determining whether the patent holder submitted a timely patent extension application. The PTO is implementing that decision and believes the court's decision resolves the problem for Medco. Because of this ongoing litigation, the manager's amendment struck language pertaining to Medco. The Conyers Amendment seeks to reinsert that provision. The Conyers Amendment essentially codifies the district court's decision, but it ignores the fact that this case is on appeal. We need to let the courts resolve the pending litigation. It is standard practice for Congress not to interfere when there is ongoing litigation. If the Federal Circuit rules against Medco, generic manufacturers of the drug could enter the marketplace immediately rather than waiting another five years. This has the potential to save billions of dollars in health care expenses. While the amendment is drafted so as to apply to other companies similarly situated, as a practical matter, this is a special fix for one company. Finally, it would be more appropriate for this to be considered as a private relief bill. Private relief bills are designed to provide benefits to a specific individual or corporate entity. The House and the Judiciary Committee have procedures in place to ensure that such bills are properly vetted. This amendment ignores those procedures and denies members the opportunity to know the consequences of what they are voting on. To summarize, Madam Chair, we should not interfere with ongoing litigation, which may be unprecedented, and we should give this issue regular process in the Judiciary Committee. I oppose the amendment and urge my colleagues to defeat it, and I'll yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back.